Um, so I have with me on the line Michael Cremo from LA. Um, are you there, Michael? Yes, I am, James. Today we're going to go into the extreme antiquity of mankind, Michael, where others uh, may concentrate on alternative history um, in the era 10,000 to 20,000 BC, say. But uh, just a bit about your background, Michael, and how did you get involved in the extreme antiquity, which I believe is hundreds of thousands to, if, if not millions of years old? Well, uh, James, this has something to do with the way I was uh, raised. Uh, you know, my, my father was a military officer in the United States Air Force, and that meant a couple of things for me as I was growing up. First, it meant I was living in a lot of different places, including Europe when I was growing up. So that had an influence on, on me. It, 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 it made me realize there's more than one way to look at the world. You know, the American way is one way, but there are lots of other people that have other different ways of, of looking at the world. So that was a big influence on, on me. And I got exposed to a lot of different worldviews and cultures. So that was a good thing. That was a positive thing for me. Uh, for example, you know, when I was 16, I was living in Germany. And on my school vacations, I would go different places in Europe. So one school vacation, I went with a friend of mine uh, up to Sweden, and I was staying in a youth hostel in Stockholm. And I met some some kids who had gone overland to Europe. I mean, this was back in the 1960s, so you could do it in those days. It's much more dangerous to try to do it today. But, but uh they had gone overland from Europe to India, and they were telling me about all the fantastic things they'd seen in India, the Ganges rivers, different yogis and mystics, and the Himalayan mountains. So I became fascinated with India. And, uh, and you know, as you, as you kind of grow older, you know, you, you've got to, you may have been exposed to a lot of different worldviews, but eventually you've got to construct your own. And I found the the one that was most helpful for me was the worldview of ancient India. That that really answered a lot of questions for me. Eventually, you know, I uh, became a disciple of a guru from India, and I, you know, I I studied the ancient Sanskrit writings, especially the. Puranas, which are the historical writings, and they had these accounts of human civilizations, human populations going back millions of years. It, it was it was something completely different than I ever learned from any of my teachers in school or university. And in school and university, they were giving the, the standard theories that humans like us first appeared less than 200,000 years ago, having evolved from more primitive ape-like human ancestors. But in, in these ancient books of knowledge, they were saying something quite different. And I'm talking not just about, you know, the, the, traditional wisdom system from India, but a lot of the world's ancient wisdom traditions have this idea that humans have been on Earth for vast periods of time, going back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. So that kind of got me uh, questioning, well, is that just mythology, or is there perhaps some factual basis for it. So that's what got me looking into archaeology. And of course, if you look in the current textbooks, you're only going to see the evidence that goes along with the current dominant theories. But I decided, I decided, okay, let me look beyond the textbooks. Let me look into the original scientific reports. And I have a reading knowledge of a lot of the European languages. 
German, French, Italian. I can't speak them very well, but I can read archaeological reports in them. So I looked at the reports, not just in English, but in a lot of the different European languages, and not just the most recent ones, but I, I kind of looked back into the earlier uh, history of archaeology as well, going back into the 19th century to the time of Darwin. So when I did that, I found lots of reports of archaeologists and other scientists finding human bones, human artifacts, and human footprints going back much further than 200,000 years or so, going back, in some cases, many millions of years. So I collected all those reports, and I put them together in a book called Forbidden Archaeology. So that's how so that's how I got into this whole topic James. Very interesting and, and I remember you saying once before that you know you really did go to the original sources you know you followed up all these leads all around the world you chased them down if you will um from artifacts personal collections museums written accounts and um, that must have been quite a long process to compi compile forbidden archaeology you must you must have been chasing that information down for quite a while. Yeah, James, you know what, in the beginning, I was thinking, I didn't know what I would find. I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll do eight weeks of research, I'll find a few interesting facts, I'll write a short article or booklet about it, and I'll go on to something else, because I've got lots of interest. But, you know, that as I got into it, that one case just led to another, and that eight yeah, that eight weeks turned into eight months, and then the eight months turned into eight years of research. Uh, so, uh, it, as you say, it, it, it did involve a lot of research. Although in the beginning, I didn't know it was going to turn out like that, but when I started digging into things, one thing just led to another, and, and, and it turned out to be eight years of research that went into the writing of Forbidden Archaeology. Sure. Now, uh, that was the first book I was introduced to you. I, I have seen you on made, many media publications. Um, you, you're, you speak at conferences. You've been on, I think it was the Mysterious, Mysterious Oranges of Man I first uh, came across, Michael Cremo. Um, and finally, I know I, I remember you on that. And, you know, I, I felt here's a guy talking, uh, talking sense. He's concise. He's articulate. And he's turning up evidence that's contrary to what we're told, you know. And, and it really opened up doors to me to look at alternative history in a different light. Um, but you come across what you call the knowledge filtration system, as, as it is, because um, you, you upturn bones, footprints, artifacts that contradict the theory of evolution, Michael. Um, but you, as you can say, could you expect, uh, perhaps explain the knowledge filtration that, that uh, filters out this information for, for the listeners today? Well, you know, I, I, here's how I kind of stumbled on that. You know, I started you know, my research in the history of archaeology, not expecting to find very much in the way of scientific reports for, you know, archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity. In other words, reports of evidence that humans were existing much further back in time than most scientists are now prepared to accept. I thought, well, maybe there's a few of them. And, and then, but I found there were a lot of them. And I was just wondering, yeah, well, why is it that these reports are there in the original scientific literature, but they're not in the textbooks? You know, you know, I, you know, so I, I thought about it, and I, I could sort of see that what was going on was a process of knowledge filtration, whereby you know the reports that support you know, the dominant theories, you know, they make their way into the textbooks and the public presentations, but evidence that may be just as good, which happens to contradict a dominant theory, gets filtered out, it gets set aside, ignored, and, and in some cases actively suppressed. So I, I, I call that process of... Uh, suppression, knowledge, filtration, and it may not be deliberate. The people who may be doing it may, may be thinking 
well, I'm just being a responsible scientist. This doesn't fit in with, you know, the, the, the dominant theory. So something must be wrong with it. So I'm just being responsible and not report. But, but the effect of it is that people don't get the full set of facts with which to make their judgments about, you know, big questions like, where did we come from and how long have we been here? So, so, uh, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, people, you know, ask me, well, why, why is, this not, why has this happened, basically? Why is it going on? You know, and, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons for it. First of all, I think it's just human nature. You know, for example, if I love somebody and somebody tells me something bad about the person I love, I don't want to believe it. And I may even become a little bit angry at the person who tells me these things because it, you know, it, it just doesn't fit in with my perception of the person we're talking about. So today, you know, many scientists are very much in love with the Darwinian theory of human origin. And if they hear something that contradicts it, they they find it hard to accept, and they may become a little bit angry at people who are bringing forward things like this. So, in one sense, I think it's just human nature, but I think it also has something to do with power. You know, there there's different kinds of power in the world. There's political power, there's economic power, there's military power, there's also intellectual power, which, which is a subtle power, but it's a very real one. And generally we see that those who have power, particularly monopoly power, don't like to give it up very easily. So today, you know, the scientists who are supporters of the Darwinian theory of evolution, generally in most countries, they have a government-enforced monopoly in the education systems. They're able to uh, ensure that only their ideas are taught and other ideas are excluded. So... Generally, we see that those who have monopoly power like to keep it. For example, if one corporation has a monopoly in a certain sector of the economy, it, you know, it doesn't want to give up its position. Or if one political party has a monopoly in the political life of a community or a nation, it, you know, it doesn't like to give up its position very easily. So similarly, those who have a monopoly in the education system and the scientific institutions, they don't like to give up their monopoly position very, very, very easily. And I think what I've been able to do in my book, Forbidden Archaeology, was not only uh, document evidence for extreme human antiquity, but I've also been able to document how the knowledge filtering process operates in you know, particular cases. Sure. I think one good example of that, Michael, is uh, I, I remember in Forbidden Archaeology, there's a lovely appendix at the back for uh, extreme uh, antiquity and artifacts, and the Nampa figurine, you actually say you know, that the very um, effort by mainstream to explain this object away could also be used to explain their own evidence away. You know, it's the same theory um, or the same method of explaining away facts can be used for both sides. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. That Napa image you're talking about, that was uh, a figurine of a female human-like figure that came up from a well that was being drilled near the town of Nampa in the state of Idaho in the United States. The, the, the drilling of the well had gone down about 300 feet 
you know, it's about 100 meters. And, you know, the drill had gone down through many different layers of rock. And finally, at, you know, the 300 foot level, this human figurine was brought up. And, you know, I consulted modern geologists about the age of the geological formations at, at this place. You know, I had a copy of the drilling record, you know, how the drill had gone down through so many feet of this kind of rock and so many feet of that kind of rock down to that 300-foot level. So uh, we asked modern geologists from the state of uh, Idaho, how old is the formation down at that 300-foot level? And they said, well, that's about 2 million years old. So there are many scientists who just can't accept you know, that humans could have existed that far in the past, humans like us. You know, they may believe some type of ape man existed, but they don't believe that humans with developed intelligence capable of making statues and figurines existed at that time. They think that sort of thing, according to the normal theories, started about twenty or 30,000 years ago. So to have this sort of evidence at two million years or or even more was just impossible for scientists to accept. So they started coming up with explanations. Well, it must have been a figurine that kind of slipped down from the surface through some kind of fissure. And, you, you know, I mean, they did demonstrate that any such fissure existed. They just said, well, that's what had to have happened. Yeah, it's but, extreme methods to explain it away, though, Michael. Extreme methods. Yeah, but you could explain away any evidence like that, even the evidence that supports the current theories. You know, you could explain it away like that. So uh, one feature of this knowledge filtering process is what I call a double standard in applying uh, procedures for judging. You know, this, uh, the case of the Nampa image that you brought up is a good example of that, where a double standard was applied. Yeah, where you, in the case of evidence that doesn't fit the theories, you're free to invent all kinds of ways in which it could be wrong. But if you applied those same standards to the evidence that's now in the textbooks, you'd have to throw all that out as well. So it, it, yeah, it's just another example of how the knowledge filtering process operates. I suppose... Before we get into some artifacts, has there been, just on a personal note, has there been any acceptance, acceptance of evidence or research or these artifacts or even discussion from mainstream? Has it soaked up to anybody yet? Well, it has in this sense that I'm, if ideas are going to change, the first thing is that scientists have to be willing to listen to alternative evidence and different kinds of ideas. And I have found that within the scientific world, within the community of archaeologists, there are some who are willing to listen to new ideas and evidence that contradicts the current theories. Therefore, you know, I've been able to speak at major international conferences of archaeology and present some of this evidence. Now, that isn't, I'm, you know, I'm not going to pretend that uh, everyone who hears me immediately changes their minds and starts to agree with me, but I think the fact that at least some scientists are willing to listen to new ideas is a hopeful sign. Now, among those who do listen to me, some agree with me, and they're few in number at this time, because that's 
how things work in the world of science, but I would say it's a hopeful sign. Yeah. I think yeah, I think we're in a new paradigm. I, I think it's got a long way to go, but a lot more people are open to alternative history than say ten years ago. Um, there's definitely a shift in consciousness. Um, you know, you can see it in people, and, and a lot of new radio shows popping up too, discussing a lot of this stuff too, Michael. Um, so perhaps for the new listeners, let's let's talk about some artifacts, Michael, because this is what really sells it for me. Um, you know, you've upturned some very very interesting evidence and. It's actually the variety of artifacts that come up too, Michael. It's there's looks like engineered artifacts. There's um, as you say, the, the Nampa figurine. There's coins. There's human footprints and bones. And um, perhaps the most fascinating one that grabs me first is the South African metallic spheres, um, because I think that's the most extreme antiquity you have uncovered yet. Is that right? Uh, yes, they're puzzling artifacts. You know, if you read what I have to say about them in Forbidden Archaeology. They're, they're, what, what they are is they're round objects. I call them metallic because they're, they're made of hematite, which is a, a naturally occurring type of iron ore. And it's actually considered a semi-precious stone. You can find jewelry made of hematite. Miners in South Africa have found many of these round metallic objects. They're one or two inches in diameter. And, you know, the, the most interesting is the pair grooves that go around the center of each object. Some of them have two grooves, some have three, some have four. And, you know, you were mentioning, uh, a little bit earlier that you know you made a reference to the television documentary Mysterious Origins of Man and and uh, the you know the producer of that documentary had gotten in touch with me and he wanted to include some cases from forbidden archaeology in in the documentary so these round metallic spheres that come from South Africa are one of the cases that he chose to include in the documentary. Now, what's really interesting about these things is they're found in mineral deposits over 2 billion years old, which is really quite astonishing. And, and uh, you know, the question is, are these things, something that would form naturally in the layers of the earth or or do we have to invoke some kind of human intelligence being involved in their their manufacture so it's interesting uh uh this documentary mysterious origins of man was shown on nbc which was one of the big american television networks but you know, before NBC would allow these spheres to be included in the documentary, they told the producer, uh, you have to give them to an independent company of metallurgists for examination. So that was done. And the metallurgist said, you know, they could not explain how these things could have formed naturally in the layers of the earth which which means that that you have to consider that if they can't be explained naturally that you would have to invoke some kind of human intelligence being involved in their production up to up to up to 2 billion years ago now, I'll, I'll say this. If somebody can come up with a, a convincing, geologically realistic and proven explanation of how they could have formed naturally in the Earth, then I'd be prepared to admit that. But at the present moment, I really haven't encountered anything that rises to that level of certainty. I mean, you, you, I mean there are people who make all kinds of uh, 
claims about how they could have formed naturally, but I haven't really seen any other uh, good example of of grooves being formed with such precision. You know, that it, it's so I I would say you know you have to re- understand one thing is that I'm open to changing my mind about any of the cases that I've reported in Forbidden Archaeology, if somebody can give me convincing reasons to do so. But at this, at this particular moment, I, I'm still, still open to the possibility that those metallic spheres with, from South Africa with the parallel grooves going around the center of them are produced by human beings. Sure, and I'm from an engineering background, um, mostly mechanical, and uh, I've studied metallurgy too, Michael, um, for my degree. And you know, uh, from the same perspective, I, they just look engineered to me. That's 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 from an engineer. I I can't see any natural process that would do that. Um, they they certainly do. You know, they're they're such a fascinating object that you and you've actually gone to South Africa yourself and seen these in the in the bedrock. Is that correct? Yeah. But, uh few years ago I, ha- I I went to South Africa I had gone there to uh, speak at universities and uh, speak at a meeting of the World Archaeological Congress that was held in Cape Town and uh, when I was in Johannesburg I uh, made an appointment to meet the chief mining engineer from the mine where these objects were found and See, one, one, uh, kind of skeptical doubt about these objects is, well, maybe, you know, there are, uh, round hematite concretions, but then somebody maybe took one of those naturally occurring round hematite concretions and then kind of, uh, engraved the grooves around them. But uh, this mining engineer you know, from the mine told me that's uh, not really a good explanation. He showed me a solid block, a huge block of mineral from the mine that had these round objects solidly embedded in them, kind of like, you could say, like raisins in a, you know, a, a dome or something, yeah. And some of them were halfway, some of them were halfway protruding out of the rock. And I could see the grooves on these objects that were solidly embedded in the rock going back into uh, the solid rock. So, so I, I did see that personally uh, when I was in South Africa having a meeting with the chief mining engineer from the mine from which these objects come. Sure. How many objects are there, Michael? How many of these ball, uh, spherical balls are there? Well, there are uh, apparently a lot of them. I don't know the exact number. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, This mining engineer had sent me to America you know, some specimens which were used in the filming of the documentary, The Mysterious Origins of Man. I mean, there, there's quite a few of them. I understand. I, I, I don't have any idea of what the exact number is. But, uh, there's a photograph of one of them in, uh, my book, Forbidden Archaeology. And that photograph had been sent to me by uh, Rolf Marx, who was uh, the director of the museum in which these specimen, that specimen was being kept, uh, it was the Natural History Museum in Klerksdorp, South Africa, and it was interesting. A, 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 when the book was published, a Dutch television producer saw. Uh, the picture and the description, and you know he wanted to go down to South Africa and film that particular object. And 
you know, the one in the museum. So I put him in touch with uh, the director of the museum. But the museum director reported that that particular object had been stolen from the museum. You know, it was really, you know, and he said it had been stolen by a person he characterized as a white witch. So I hope it's being put to good use somewhere. Oh, <laughs> you know, please, please, God, please, God, it is. You know, just in, in terms of artifacts that look engineered, the Illinois coin is one that's really fascinating as well, Michael. And I was just looking at a picture of it today, and it's so eerily similar to the Irish modern 50p. Uh, we're now in the euro uh, uh, currency at the moment, but the old Irish 50p from a decade ago, you know, it just looks like a modern coin, but it's found at a layer that's somewhere between 200 to 400,000 years old. Is that correct? Yeah, that 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 was uh, discovered in the United States in the state of Illinois. Uh, I, I think the place was Lawn Spring that, that it was uh, found at. And it was in the 19th century. And again, this was a case of a well boring. Uh, a well was being drilled. And at this location, and it went down about 114 feet. And at that level, this copper object, which is in the shape of a, you know, looks like a coin, came up. And on, on the surface of this copper coin-like object, there's a human figure. There are human figures and an inscription and an unknown script. And it, it was reported by a researcher from the Smithsonian Institution in the United States, a scientific research institution, and it was published in an academic journal. And, you know, in, in that report published in an academic journal, there was the drilling record that the drill had gone down through five feet of sand and six feet of clay and three feet of rock. You know, it had the whole drilling record. So uh, what we did is we uh, gave the drilling record to geologists of the State Geological Survey of Illinois, and we asked them how old is the formation down at that 114 foot level and uh, they reported back we didn't tell them about the coin we just gave them the you know because sometimes if you do that you know then they yeah they I, I know they, they don't they don't answer you so we just made it a, a simple request you know to you know, gave them the drilling record told them where it was from and, and, and they said well that level that you're talking about is from the Yarmuthian formation. It's you know, between 200,000 and 400,000 years old. Now that's really quite interesting because according to the current theories, the oldest coins are about only about 3,000 years old. They come from a, a place called Lydia, which is now within the boundaries of the modern country of Turkey. So uh, so to have this kind of thing going on perhaps as much as 400,000 years ago is really quite extraordinary. According to modern theories, there weren't any anatomically modern humans at that time. Uh, there, there were no civilizations. There was no artwork. There was no developed economies and things like that. So it, it's really kind of a an extraordinary discovery, you know. It's but it's been filtered out of modern archaeology. And the reason I say it looks like the modern Irish 50p was to give you that, you know. It, this may be such an extreme antiquity, it just looks like something we create today, and it's a polygonal shape. I think there's seven sides on it, and there's seven sides on the Irish and the Old English 50p as well. So it really does right. like something modern we could come up with today, but, you know. Um, just we're going to come up to a break very soon, Michael. I just want to 
probably just talk about another couple of artifacts that uh, occur in coal deposits because coal miners have upturned some stuff and that's very important too because of the formation of coal. Um, perhaps you could just give us an example on that. Yes, uh, many, many objects have turned up in coal deposits and I th many of these reports are from the 19th century because in those days the coal mining was pretty much hands-on. Today it's all done with huge machines and they grind everything up and it's, but from those earlier days there were many interesting reports of things being found in coal. Uh, sometimes uh, human bones were found in coal deposits. There was a case uh, that was reported in a scientific journal called The Geologist uh, from the 19th century that told of an anatomically modern human skeleton being found 90 feet deep in coal deposits in the state of Illinois. Uh, it was in Macoupin County, Illinois, and according to the scientific report, above the coal deposit, there was a thick layer of slate rock that uh, extended for hundreds of meters in all directions, and that layer of slate rock was unbroken, which kind of rules out the possibility that you know, the human skeleton could have come down from some higher, more recent level into the coal deposit. And the coal deposit was about 300 million years old, according to modern geologists from the state of Illinois. And there was a, another case from the state of, same state of Illinois. Uh, there was a case of a woman named uh, uh, Mrs. Robert Culp, who was putting a big piece of coal into her coal-burning stove, and the piece of coal, you know, it was a big one, so she broke it in half, and inside this piece of coal, she found a gold chain about 10 inches long, and, you know, from this report, you know, we could, we got the name of the mine that the coal came from, and yeah, we did a little research with the State Geological Survey of Illinois, and they said the coal from that particular mine is, again, about 300 million years old. And then there was a, another case from the state of Oklahoma in the United States. Uh, there's a town called Hevener, Oklahoma. And Outside that town, there was a coal mine that had gone down about two miles into the earth. And, you know, the coal miners, they were blasting out what they call rooms with dynamite. You know, that's how they operated. Uh, you know, they would explode some dynamite to blast out what they would call a room, and then they would bring the coal out. So as they were bringing uh, the coal out after uh, a blast like that, they found at one end of the tunnel, or the room as they called it, a wall made of six inch blocks of stone that were perfectly polished so that you, know, you could see your reflection in them, basically. And when they report, when the miners reported that, to uh, the company officials. The, they just took them out of the mine, closed the mine, sent, them, sent the miners to another mine to work. It, it's, and again, those coal deposits are about 300 million years old. So there are a lot of interesting things that have been found in coal mines. Now, some of these things are reported in scientific literature, so we hear about them. But I think, I mean, my suspicion is that a lot more was discovered by miners that just never really got reported in any type of scientific literature. It's only a small percentage gets out, I think, Michael, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, they may have, you know, found something interesting and, 
just kept it on the mantelpiece in the home, and then maybe uh, when they died, you know, then the relatives just thought, "What's this junk?" and threw it away. So I suspect, I, so I suspect, if you uh, went back into some coal mining areas and talked to the miners, uh, especially. You know, the ones who were operating before everything became completely mechanized, uh, you'd encounter some pretty interesting things from coming from coal mines. Sure. Um, so I have with me on the line Michael Cremo from LA. Um, are you there, Michael? Yes, I am, James. Today we're going to go into the extreme antiquity of mankind, Michael, where others uh, may concentrate on alternative history um, in the era 10,000 to 20,000 BC, say. But uh, just a bit about your background, Michael, and how did you get involved in the extreme antiquity, which I believe is hundreds of thousands to that humans like us first appeared less than 200,000 years ago, having evolved from more primitive ape-like human ancestors. But in, in these ancient books of knowledge, they were saying something quite different. And I'm talking not just about you know, the, the traditional wisdom system from India, but a lot of the world's ancient wisdom traditions have this idea that humans have been on Earth for vast periods of time, going back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. So that kind of got me uh, questioning, well, is that just mythology, or is there perhaps some factual basis for it. So that's what got me look, living in Germany. And on my school vacations, I would go different places in Europe. So one school vacation, I went with a friend of mine uh, up to Sweden. And I was staying in a youth hostel in Stockholm. And I met some some kids who had gone overland to Europe. I mean, this was back in the 1960s, so you could do it in those days. It's much more dangerous to try to do it today. But but uh, they had gone overland from Europe to India, and they were telling me about all the fantastic things they'd seen in India, the Ganges rivers, different yogis and mystics, and the Him Himalayan mountains. So I became fascinated with India. And, uh, and you know, yeah, as you as you kind of grow older, you know, you, you've got to, you may have been exposed to a lot of different worldviews, but eventually you've got to construct your own. And I found that the one that was most helpful for me was the worldview of ancient India. That, that really answered a lot of questions for me. Eventually, you know, I uh, became a disciple of a guru from India and I, you know, I, I studied the ancient Sanskrit writings, especially the Puranas, which are the historical writings. And they had these accounts of human civilizations, human populations going back millions of years. It, it was, it was something completely different than I ever learned from any of my teachers in school or university. In, in school and university, they were giving the, the standard theory. If, if not millions of years old. Well, uh, James, this has something to do with the way I was uh, raised. Uh, you know, my, my father was a military officer in the United States Air Force, and that meant a couple things for me as I was growing up. First, it meant I was living in a lot of different places. 
including Europe when I was growing up. So that had an influence on, on me. It, 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 it made me realize there's more than one way to look at the world. You know, the American way is one way, but there are lots of other people that have other different ways of, of looking at the world. So that was a big influence on, on me. And I got exposed to a lot of different worldviews and cultures. So that was a good thing. That was a positive thing for me. Uh, for example, you know, when I was 16, I was 